first thing we're going to want to do in order to tether our camera is obviously connect it. Now, anytime you connect a camera to Aperture and turn the camera on, Aperture sees it as a device that it can import from. So the first thing that's going to happen here is the import dialog box is going to come up. In order to shoot in tethered mode, we just need to cancel out of that. So I'm just going to go down to the cancel button and I'm going to click that to get out of the import dialog box. Next thing we're going to want to do is go under the file menu, choose tether and choose start session. It'll bring up the tether settings. Now the tether settings are uh, basically a small version of the import dialog box and they ask us where we want to import our images to uh, and then some things about what we want to do to the images. So for example, I'm going to just type in my name here and my copyright information and now all the images that I bring in are going to be brought in with this copyright information. I'm going to hit the start session button. We'll notice that there's a small icon next to this project and it shows us that the D3 is connected. It shows us what the name of the project is that we're going to be importing into. Now at this point I can do a couple of things to capture the image. I can either push the shutter release button on the camera, at which point the tethered shooting will start, or I can hit this capture button. Since our studio isn't terribly attractive, we've tethered a camera about 150 feet away to a support pointing outside, uh, and so we're going to hit the capture button now. And what this is going to do is going to instruct the camera to take a picture. We'll notice that the importing dialog starts to spin and it shows us that's importing an image. And then when it's done, we'll see that the new image has been imported into Aperture. At this point, we're going to hit the capture button. And when we hit the capture button, it's going to start a capture process, which is going to bring that image in from our camera. We'll notice when we do that, that the import dialog box starts to spin. And then after it's done spinning, it's uh, imported automatically into Aperture. Now, a couple things to remember about this. The first of all is that the cameras usually use USB 2.0 instead of FireWire, so their transfer time isn't fantastic. However, since you're going to be shooting straight into your Aperture project, you don't have to take the card out, bring it to a card reader, do a transfer. Another great thing about this is that you can actually start working on images while you're shooting. So you can have a studio assistant sitting at the computer and start to do color correction and keyword and captioning to your images while the photographer keeps shooting with their, their camera in tethered shooting mode. When you're done and you're finished doing tethered shooting, you simply hit the stop session button and aperture disconnects from the camera. For those who really like to customize their working experience, Aperture's got a great new tool that was inherited from Final Cut. It's the Customize tool, and the Customize tool allows us to change the keyboard shortcuts and add keyboard assignments for anything that we can do in Aperture. So if I go underneath the Aperture menu and I choose Commands and I move over to Customize, it's going to bring up a panel that's going to be very familiar to Final Cut Pro users. Essentially, the new Command Editor allows us to make keyboard shortcuts for all the tools. Now, a number of the tools have shortcuts, but there's a wider range of things in Aperture that don't by default have keyboard shortcuts assigned to them. And normally you'd have to access these through either the menus or the buttons. What the command editor lets you do is find any keyboard shortcut that's in Aperture and assign keyboard shortcuts. Not only that, but it's going to let you change the keyboard shortcuts as well. So if, for example, you don't like the Control F key here being the film strip shortcut, well, we can change that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here and I'm going to choose Duplicate. This is going to make me a brand new uh, command editor. I'm going to call this David's commands. This gives me the ability now to change things. And so if I go to the film strip view and I go over to the keyboard modifiers, I can simply choose something else that I want to do. And so let's say I want control shift F. Now that I have control shift F as my shortcut for film strip view. By default, the command editor will leave the original shortcut and add the new shortcut. So all I'd have to do if I wanted to get rid of the shortcut here is click on it and hit delete. Now control shift F does the film strip command instead of just control F. Another great thing about this new tool is that it allows you to find all the things that Aperture can do. You can either sort by all of Aperture's commands or by the main menu commands or click this drop down and now you see a subset of all the commands that it can do. And so these are all the keys that are assigned to things. Anything with a blank space is not assigned to something. This gives us some really interesting and powerful ways to customize Aperture. You'll also notice that some of the keys up here have different colors assigned to them. That shows you what part of the interface those control. And so the light blue keys are the tools, the orange keys control metadata, the purple keys control interface, and so on. It's a nice visual way to learn Aperture's keyboard shortcuts.
And speaking of customization, in Aperture 1.5, it was only possible to change the background of the viewer and the browser by full grayscale stops. In the new version of Aperture, Aperture 2, you can now change these by actual individual percentages. So we can customize exactly how we want the backgrounds of our viewer and our browser windows to look. Aperture 1.5 on an export would bring up a dialog box indicating how many files had to be exported, but it wouldn't let you do anything else at the time. It wasn't background processing. Aperture 2, however, has complete background processing for exporting of images, which allows us to start an export process and then go on and do anything else we want to do. So you'll see I have about 360 images selected here. Now, normally exporting 360 images at something like a full-size JPEG would take a really long time, and Aperture would be completely unusable during that point. I'd have to walk away, go do something else, and come back when Aperture was done rendering. This is a big problem, especially on slower machines like this Mac Mini that we're working on. Now in Aperture 2.0, I'm simply going to go under the File menu. I'm going to go to Export. I'm going to export versions of these images. It's going to verify the images, and then it's going to bring up the standard export dialog box. I'm going to right now just leave these as a JPEG of their original size. I'm going to make a new folder. I'm going to call that Export, and then I'm going to export the versions. At this point in Aperture 1.5, I'd have to go get a cup of coffee. Well, now I can keep working. We're going to notice that down here, Aperture is going to show me that it's exporting. There's a new little bit of text that tells me what Aperture is doing. If I want, I can also go up into the Windows menu here. I can choose Show Activity, and I can take a look at the Activity Monitor, and I'll see here how many of my images have been exported. I also have the ability to pause tasks here, or I can cancel the task if I decide that I don't really want to export all these images. But the great thing is now I can just keep going in my images. And so now I'm going to click on an image. This was an image that was part of the export process. Now I can go and do something like add exposure adjustments to this image, or I can do some changes to this image, all while Aperture keeps working in the background. A subtle but really an important change in Aperture 2.0 is how the program handles exporting metadata along with your master files. Now, originally in Aperture, the idea was once you created a master file, uh, you had an original raw version, that Aperture never wanted to write any data into that file. The argument that the photographers gave was that if you're going to export a master file, so another version basically of a raw file, there was no reason not to include the metadata in with that. There's nothing that was going to harm the original raw file by writing into that raw file. So the Aperture team obviously was listening to photographers' comments on this one because now when we go to export a master file, it gives us the ability to include the metadata along with that master file export. So I'm going to bring up the export dialog box, and I've chosen to export a master file. And we notice here that I have a new choice, and it says metadata, don't include IPTC, include IPTC, or create an IPTC uh, for sidecar file. Now that last choice was available in Aperture 1.5, but the new choice here, the include IPTC, means that when I hit the export masters button, it's going to embed into the raw file all the IPTC data that I originally added to this file. That's very handy if you're passing your file off to a client or somebody who's not using Bridge and they need to read the master data. And it's a nice compromise because it means that you can finally include IPTC data along with a raw file just as long as you don't write it to the original raw file that you uh, imported from your camera in the first place. Anyone who prints frequently knows that in order to get a really good crisp print, you need to do a little bit of sharpening before you send your job to the printer. In Aperture 1.5, that would require making a separate version of your image and doing sharpness to that second version and then printing the version. That's great since you can always remove an adjustment, but that required a lot of extra steps. Aperture 2.0 has a new and much simpler tool for adding sharpness when you print. When the print dialog box comes up, we'll see that there's now two new choices. There's the sharpen amount and the sharpen radius. All we have to do in order to make our image a little sharper for output is drag these sliders where we want them. All we have to do is drag these sliders to where we want them, and that will add the sharpness that we need in our image. And since Aperture can bring up the loop tool at any time, I can bring up the loop while I'm here inside the print dialog box and use it to check my sharpness. This is zooming in, this is doing live, real-time looking at the sharpness. And you'll see as I drag the slider, it's going to change the preview that's in the loop. The great thing about this, though, is that these sharpen tools can be saved as a preset, just like anything else in the print dialog box, which means that once you've set up the sharpness for your type of printer, you never have to think about it again.